Hello, I'm Sandy Lush and I'm an avid hand quilter. When I first started making quilts in 1990, hand quilting seemed to be the only option available. Patchwork was made using a sewing machine, but the quilting was invariably done by hand as machine quilting was rather frowned upon. I didn't really enjoy hand quilting over all the seams in my patchwork quilts. So when machine quilting started to become popular, I tried my hand at it, but failed. I went to a class, but even the teacher couldn't get my sewing machine to quilt. By the time I had replaced it with a machine that could, I had fallen in love with hand stitching whole cloth quilts. And so out of the 200 or so quilts I have made, only five have been quilted on a sewing machine. As I've never had the patience to perfect my machine quilting skills, they are nowhere near as good as my hand quilting ones. So what made me love hand quilting in the first place? Partly, it's the feel of a hand quilted quilt. A hand quilted piece remains soft and drapes beautifully, even if stitched intensively. In comparison, Machine quilted pieces are very stiff. They hang well in quilt shows, but are nowhere near as soft and as cuddly to use. Quilting is functional and is there to hold the three layers of a quilt together, but it also adds texture to any quilt. Well-designed quilting patterns will also give additional visual impact. Watching my stitching gradually bring a quilt to life is something I never tire of seeing. Stitching by hand is very tactile and is a very personal experience. It may be slow, but not only is it pleasurable, it is also sociable. I can sit and chat with friends while quilting or sit with the family and watch the TV in the evening. Well, maybe I listen to it. Sitting in a comfy chair, hand stitching a quilt, or it can be so relaxing. And with practice, the hands can move while leaving the mind free to plan the next quilt. Hand quilting is also portable. If the quilt I'm working on isn't too large, I can take my work with me on holiday. And providing I've got a good supply of threaded quilting needles, I can even stitch while traveling by train. The throwaway line in quilting magazines tells you that the quilting stitch is a simple running stitch. Actually, it's a lot more complicated than that. And as with any new technique, it will take practice to learn how to hand quilt. This class aims to help you get off to a good start. When you make a patchwork quilt, you're told to use all cotton fabrics, although patchwork can also be made using silk or silk cotton. If you're making what is known as a whole cloth quilt, then you can use many other types of fabric. So as well as cotton, you can use calico, cotton sateen, which can sometimes be found in mottled colours, novelty fabrics such as lame, silk, and finally satin, although this can be difficult to work with. It is better to learn how to hand quilt on a plain or solid coloured piece of fabric as it will be easier to see what you're doing. So I suggest you use a plain or solid coloured cotton with a nice open weave. The weave is important as tightly woven fabrics make it harder to get the needle through. Barley fabrics are wonderful for applique as they don't fray but they're very, very tightly woven and this makes them very difficult to hand quilt. If you're unsure of a fabric, it's quite useful to take a pin and then you can run the pin through the fabric and if the fabric resists and makes it hard to get the pin through, then I suggest you find something else. If you use a printed fabric, the pattern can be distracting and that makes it harder to get nice even stitches. A mottled fabric such as this is fine, 
but even though the print is small on this fabric, the pattern is very distracting and it makes it harder to concentrate on your stitching. As you're not joining pieces together, you can also use polycotton sheeting. This can be very useful when making a big quilt as it comes in wide widths and saves you having to join it. Probably the favourite material to use in a beginner's class is what the British call calico and the Americans call muslin. Be very careful to buy this from a reputable quilt shop as this fabric comes in 11 different weights from fine calico for quilting up to fabric that can be used to cover chairs. The thickness and the weave can vary from bolt to bolt but I have generally found Rocklong calico to be reliable. Fabrics often have a dressing called size, which is there to stiffen and stabilise them. This can make it tougher to hand quilt, and so it's advisable to wash your fabric before you start. This will remove any dressing and also eliminate any shrinkage. Unfortunately, calico can crease quite badly when washed, so it's advisable to iron it with a very hot iron while it is still damp. For my sample, I have decided to use a piece of oak shot cotton. But once you have mastered hand quilting, you can go on and use any of the other fabrics such as the silks and satins. Whatever your fabric choice, you will need another piece of fabric for the backing of your quilted piece. The same applies to the weave for this backing fabric as for the front, as your stitches need to go through all three layers. If you're making a cushion, a fine lawn backing will work well. If you're making a quilt, it will help to hang well if the backing fabric is slightly heavier than the top fabric. In actual fact, it was much easier to mark and stitch this dotted backing fabric, and so I quilted the piece from this reverse side. This means my best stitches are on the back, and the not quite so regular underneath stitches are on the front. However, the very busy prints in the patchwork make this almost unnoticeable. Whatever backing you use, it needs to have a nice open weave. Having chosen your fabric, that leaves just the choice of which wadding or batting to use for the middle of your quilt sandwich, and which type you use can very much influence your hand stitching. There are a bewildering number of waddings available and they can be roughly divided into two types. Needle punched ones and bonded fibre ones. Generally, these bonded ones are good for hand quilting and the needle punched ones are best for machine quilting. So let's start with the needle punched ones and explain why they are difficult to use. The fibres for all of these waddings are matted together to give a firm, flat wadding that will machine quilt beautifully, but resist the needle by hand. These are mainly cotton, but there is also an 80-20 blend which has some polyester mixed in with the cotton and various weights of bamboo. Most of them contain a fine mesh, which is called scrim. And the scrim is there to prevent the wadding stretching while under the sewing machine. The presence of this scrim will make needle punch waddings even harder to hand quilt. My bamboo sample has a scrim, but it is actually slightly easier to stitch than the cotton one. You can get cotton wadding without scrim. And there are needle punch polyester waddings also that don't have scrim. Unfortunately, without the stabiliser, they are all extremely stretchy. Cotton and bamboo waddings often contain small dark flecks, which may show through very fine fabrics such as lawn. Some are cleaner than others, but to avoid the problem, there are cottons which have been bleached. Unfortunately, bleaching these cottons white further mats the fibres together 
and actually makes them even tougher to hand stitch. Both cotton and bamboo will both shrink when they are washed, but they will become softer when they are washed. But the shrinkage is about 3 to 5%, and this can be either a blessing or a curse. It's annoying to have to carefully pre-shrink your cotton before use, as you have to be extremely careful to only soak, but not agitate, while it is washing. Because if it's wet and you do this, it will stick to itself and just become a sticky mess. However, if you want to make a reproduction quilt, this shrinkage can be really useful. If you pre-wash your fabrics but not the wadding, the wadding will shrink after the first wash, but the fabric will not, and the quilt will be left with the softly rookered look of an antique quilt. A similar but different effect can be achieved by not washing either fabric or wadding, as they probably won't shrink by the same amount. That aside, hand stitches are best off avoiding needle punts waddings altogether. It's best to go for one of the bonded ones instead. These are light and airy and are much easier to get a needle through. Compare the stitching between these two samples. The one on the left was quilted using cotton with scrim and the one on the right with polyester wadding. The feathers in the polyester sample are fluffy whereas the ones in the cotton are much flatter. The stitching is also better on the polyester wadding than it is on the cotton one. In actual fact, I never finished it. Here is a piece of cheap polyester. Now this is thin in places, but thicker in others. And it's going bobbly now because it's getting old. But compare this to a piece of Hobbs polydown. And the Hobbs polydown is beautifully smooth, but thicker. In actual fact, you will receive more regular stitches with the poly down than you will with the cheap polyester because this has fibres that are siliconized and the needle just slips through this one. This one is more likely to give you even stitches as this one being patchy will give you small stitches where it's thin and bigger stitches where it's not. If you really prefer the flat look of cotton, then this is Hobbs Thermor, which is a thermally bonded polyester, and it will give the same effect as cotton, but be actually much easier to use. Polyester waddings are less expensive and an excellent starting point for hand quilting. However, these are hot and sticky to sleep under because they do not absorb moisture like the natural fibre waddings such as cotton and bamboo. Fortunately, there's a solution. This is Hobbs organic wool. It is a bonded natural fibre and it is wonderful to both hand and machine quilt. I personally prefer the pre-packaged variety rather than buying it by the metre off the roll because I think it's slightly thinner. Of course, this is much more expensive than the other waddings, so Start on the polyester, but do consider this one when embarking on your masterpiece. To get you started on your hand quilting journey, I have created five PDF files that can be printed on a home computer. These are for your own personal use only. There is a file that gives requirements and a summary of the instructions on how to make the cushion. There are also four pattern files and you will need to copy one of each. 
The lines labelled trim are best cut with a rotary cutter to ensure that they are straight. The edges will then overlap and you can join them with either sellotape or magic tape. And it's best to use short pieces rather than try and tape all one bit together. The finished pattern should look like this. Now I'm going to move this away and put my board on my quilt. I washed and ironed my fabric, but now I need to cut my square. I could either measure it on my board and cut it with my rotary cutter, or I can simply fold the top corner over to the bottom edge. And now I can cut that either with my scissors or with a rotary cutter. And as I'm sitting, I'll do it with my scissors. I can smooth that flat again. If I had made a crease in it, I would have to iron it again. The rest of this fabric I can now fold up and put away until later as this will be used to make the back of my cushion. To get the design onto my fabric, I'm going to bring my pattern back and I'm going to put my fabric on the top and centre it. And looking at that, I think that needs ironing again. So here's my re-ironed piece. I'm going to place the fabric onto the pattern so that there's about the same amount of fabric spare on each side. It is actually quite tempting to fold it to find the center, but then I would crease it and then I would need to re-iron it again anyway. And I'm now going to pin the fabric and the pattern together so that I can move it without either of them slipping. And I'm only going to pin them at the corners. And because my fabric is pale, I can see through it well enough to be able to trace the design on to my fabric. If my fabric is dark, then I won't be able to see through it well enough to just trace the design on accurately. In this case, I can either tape the whole thing up to a window or I can place it on a light box. When using a light box, it can be quite difficult to see where you have marked. But if you lift a corner and then look along, you can normally see which parts have been marked and which parts have been missed. Now my fabric is in position, I can trace on the pattern. And again, there is a bewildering number of quilt markers to choose from. There is dressmaker's chalk and dressmaker's pencils 
a soapstone marker, a variety of water soluble pens, quilters pencils, friction pen and felt tip, and a selection of artists' watercolour pencils and pastel pencils, and of course, just a regular HB pencil. When marking plain fabric, I normally use a Derwent Artist watercolour pencil. And these come in a wide range of colours, so I can choose one that will blend with the colour of my thread, and it will still be visible when quilting in the evenings. This is particularly useful if I am making a silk quilt which can't be washed. On the rare occasion I am using a white fabric with white thread, I tend to use a pink pencil rather than a grey one, as grey will make the fabric look dirty. When marking pattern fabrics, one particular colour pencil may not show well. And the blue water soluble ink pens are particularly useful in this case. These have to be used with care as the soluble blue ink can set to a permanent brown line if exposed to heat or strong sunlight. So don't leave your work near a radiator or in the sun when not working on it. I always sponge off the marks with cold water once they have been stitched and you will also need to thoroughly rinse your finished quilt in cold water to remove any residual ink. Soap may also react with the ink to set the lines so remove the marks with plain cold water. Having said all that, there is nothing wrong with using this type of marker if used with care, although I have to admit I only generally use one for adding or correcting lines to work already marked with a watercolour pencil. If using dark fabrics, there are white soluble pens, but these don't seem to rinse off as easily as the blue ones. You may also find that the soapstone marker or a silver marking pencil will work. The white ones tend to be quite soft and tend to rub off quite quickly, so I tend to use a yellow watercolour pencil instead. Both the blue and the white ink pens come with tips of two different sizes. And the ones with fine tips will give you a much thinner line and therefore make your stitching more accurate when you quilt over these lines. Oh, and don't even consider the air soluble markers because the ink will be gone long before you finish stitching. More recently, friction pens have become very popular, and I actually prefer the felt tip one to the biro type. The lines from these can be removed by rubbing or with the heat of a hairdryer. The lines may have become invisible but the ink is still there because if you put the work in a freezer, the lines all reappear. Again, the ink will need to be thoroughly washed out to prevent chemicals in the ink damaging your quilt in the long term. In the end, you might just decide to use a regular HB pencil. But if you do, please make sure you can remove it when you've finished quilting as there are antique quilts out there that still have dirty looking pencil lines 150 years after they were made. So out of all those choices, my preference is for a nice inert artist watercolour pencil. And now I need to choose my thread to know which colour pencil I can use. It is usual to use cotton thread as polyester can be difficult to handle. Also, when using polyester wadding, the polyester fibres in the thread can attract those in the wadding 
and bring them up to the surface and give your work a fuzzy appearance it's known as bearding. Not only does cotton thread come in many different colours, it also comes in different sizes. Regular sewing thread is now a 50 weight thread for use in sewing machines. This can also be used for hand quilting, but it does make the stitches look a little thin and lost in the fabric, so most quilters use a slightly thicker 40 weight thread. Dedicated quilting threads for both hand and machine are now all 40 weight threads. I personally prefer the more pliable machine quilting threads for hand quilting, as the dedicated hand quilting ones tend to be stiff and don't stitch well on the fine satins and silks that I like working with. There are several popular and readily available brands of quilting thread. King Tut has a wide range of variegated threads and a few solid colours. Mettler has more solid colours than variegated ones, and Wild Eye sits somewhere between the two. For colour choice, the best range of variegated thread is the King Tut, and for solid colours, it is another thread called Orophil. Orophil is becoming more readily available and comes in a huge range of solid colours and a limited range of variegated ones. This thread also comes in different thicknesses. There is a 40 weight thread, but I actually prefer their 28 weight thread as it gives my quilting stitches better definition. Coates Cotton has a limited colour range of both 40 and 30 weight threads, the latter being sold as top stitching thread, as is this Gutemann Sulky. If your stitches are large, they will look better with these slightly thicker top stitching threads. You could use also anything up to a 12 weight thickness thread. There are several sizes of Perlay thread, and this one is a size 12 as well as Orophil, which is on a red spool, and Wonderfil Fruity. All of these will still go through the eye of a big-eyed quilting needle. When learning to quilt, it is very tempting to use thread that exactly matches your fabric. This will be very effective in hiding your stitches, but it will also make it very difficult to see what you're doing. Hand quilting is all about getting evenly sized stitches, so be brave and choose a thread at least two shades darker than your fabric. You might not like the look of your first stitches, but at least you'll be able to see how you need to improve. Which thread you choose may be governed by colour or weight or even what you wish to work with and what is available. For my sample, I could use any of these threads. However, this one is too pale and that one is too thick. Any of the remaining threads will work. They may look too dark, but if I open out the spools, that will help me make a decision. And seeing that, this Aurifil variegated also looks too pale. The rest will give good stitch definition, so now I have to choose one. And I think that the golden colour of the Mettler goes better with my yellow fabric, so that is the one that's speaking to me. Having made my choice, I can now choose a watercolour pencil and between the yellow and the gold, I think I will be using a brown one.
I'm going to move the thread and mark up the pattern. I have a nice sharp point on my pencil and I will aim to trace with a single line rather than feather each movement. It's important to trace carefully and feathering will make a thicker line than a single line. Try not to make any mistakes because you might think that you will fix those when you come to them later, but actually by the time you come to stitch you'll have forgotten all about it. Remember not to press too hard because when you're quilting you will hold your work much closer to your eyes than you have your fabric while you're marking it up. And pressing too hard will cause a thicker line and also make the marks much more difficult to remove should you need to wash your fabric afterwards. Remember, you need to sharpen your pencil occasionally to keep the point nice and fine. So now I've got the main design on and now I'm going to put the outer line on it, which is only really a guide to the size of the finished piece. And if you have any pattern that has straight lines on it, then straight lines are always straighter if you draw them with a ruler. You may wish to omit this line as you will not be stitching it. It's really a guide for stitching once you've finished to either put a binding on or to make it into a cushion. Right, so here is the finished bit all marked up. And to check that I've got everything marked, if I take a couple of pins out and lift it up, I can look without the pattern underneath to check that everything is there. If you've made small mistakes, nobody will notice. If you've made a big mistake, then make the same mistake in all four quadrants and then everybody will just think it's part of the pattern. I'll take the pins and now I can take the pattern away. And here is my marked piece. Notice that the lines do look faint and it's very, very tempting when you work on a light box to press hard because you absolutely have to see what you're doing. But uh, the thicker lines actually make much more difficult stitching because you haven't got an accurate line to follow. But now this is marked up, I can make my quilt sandwich. So I'm going to move this out of the way and here is my piece of washed and ironed lawn which I am going to be using as my backing piece. I'll smooth out the creases on that. And here is my piece of poly down and I've steamed out any creases and wrinkles from where it came out of the packet and I can do that by setting the iron on steam and hovering it across and pushing out any little wrinkles. What I can't do is iron it because it's polyester and it will melt. And now I've got my mark top and that can go on the top of that 
And there is my quilt sandwich all ready to be tacked or basted together. Because I'm using polyester wadding, I need to use cotton tacking thread to prevent bearding. Cotton tacking thread is relatively inexpensive and may not be colour fast. So to avoid the possible disaster of a dye bleed, I only ever use white cotton tacking thread. Using a nice long needle, I'm going to tack in both vertical and horizontal lines, about three to four inches apart, which is about the size of my clenched fist. Tacking is only a temporary measure to hold the layers together until they are all quilted and will eventually be removed. So your stitching doesn't have to be pretty or even straight. With a small piece like this, it doesn't really matter where I start my tacking stitches. If it was a large quilt, I would either start at one end and gradually work my way to the other end. And if it was really big, I'd roll it up as I went. Or I could start in the middle and then work towards myself and away from myself. So I'm going to start in the middle today. And I normally do a little back stitch for the first stitch so that it doesn't pull all the way through. Oh, I've got a knot in it already, which is not a good start. And there's no point trying to avoid the lines that you've marked because actually you're quite your quilting stitches will go through to the other side so if they're not on the top they'll get caught underneath anyway. I'll do the stitches all in one direction first so I'll finish off this thread by doing a couple of over stitches. And I will now do another row here and another row here, turn the work round and do those lines. So I will finish up with one, two, three, four, five horizontal lines of basting. Now this length of thread isn't quite long enough and that quite often happens when you're doing a big quilt. So I've just done a little back stitch there. And I'll cut myself another piece of thread. Make a nice big cobby knot in the bottom of it. Put that in where the last little stitch is. And then, just for good measure, tie the two together. And then I can carry on. And I've got enough thread left to do another row. Right, so that is my last line of tacking and they are roughly three to four inches apart so now that is ready to quilt and for my quilting I always use a 14 inch quilting hoop and this one's a nice beach one I found this one to be the most practical size and use it for anything from a cushion up to a king size quilt 
Now, because I'm going to work in a hoop, I haven't tacked from corner to corner. And that is because working on corner to corner is working on the bias. Now, you remember the stretchy wadding? Well, all fabric has some stretch in it and some waddings are stretchier than others. And the last thing I want to do is work on the bias and stretch anything. So I'm not going to run that risk and I always keep in the straight grain of the fabric. Also, I do not pin baste. Because if I was to pin baste, and I'm just sort of randomly putting them down as if I had, when I went to put my work in my hoop, there's always one, if not more, that are in the wrong place. And if they catch, they can bend and then be very difficult to remove. And actually quilting and wire cutters are not good companions. As well as my 14 inch beach hoop, there are frames of a variety of shapes and sizes. Some are fixed on stands, others like mine are totally portable. But no matter what type you use, your quilting stitches will have a better tension working in a frame than if you crunch it up in your hands. If you simply have to do that, then you have to go back in and tack in between all of these lines in both directions so that instead of being three to four inches apart, it will be one to two inches apart. And that will help prevent little pleats forming on the back. Incidentally, if you do crunch up in your hands, you can only work on small pieces. If you want to make a big quilt, you will have to learn how to fold the quilt somehow to do that. I automatically put my thumb on the top again, but with a big quilt, that thumb that you've been using will get buried inside the quilt and then not be so easy to use. It is usual to start in the centre of your work and that is because if there are any little pleats in the fabric or any extra little bits of wadding that haven't relaxed, they can be pushed to the outside and not get trapped inside the quilting. The inner ring is the one that goes underneath. So I'm going to put that under where I'm going to stitch in the middle. And the top ring has a screw that needs to be undone so that you don't actually ram this down on your work and get the work in there too tight. Most quilters who fail when trying to use a hoop do so because they have their work stretched in so tightly that the needle will go in but it won't come back out again. That's fine for embroidery but you won't manage to quilt. The tension for quilting should be as if the cat has sat in it. So I'm actually going to pad down the centre of this before I put on my hoop. And now I can check it and I still have a nice tension there. So now I can tighten up the screw. Sometimes where that top ring fastens, a little pleat can form there. You can either take the hoop off and start all over again, but it's easier actually to make sure that you don't work in that particular area and move the hoop on before you do work there. Quilting is different to simple sewing, and for it I need thimbles. I actually wear two thimbles, one on the top middle finger and one on an underneath finger. It can be quite a challenge to find thimbles that are comfortable, as this is a very personal thing. I usually lend out a collection of thimbles during a quilting class, and these are all ones that have proved popular. As what I need in a thimble on each hand is different, I will divide them into top and underneath thimbles.
As you are going to balance the needle between two thimbles rather than hold it, it is important that the top thimble has good grip so that the needle doesn't slip. My personal favourite for the top hand is a ridged thimble as it will grip the needle from both top and from the side. You could use a silver thimble, there are some very pretty ones, but unfortunately the grip on this one is minimal. If you have swollen joints, the clover thimble will stretch over them. So will this comfort thimble, which is also extremely useful for anyone allergic to metal. A cheap plastic thimble may also work. Leather thimbles can also be used on the top hand, but although they have small areas of metal inserted, they don't protect the finger as well as these others. If you have long fingernails, you can use an open thimble. Mine is an inexpensive brass one, but you can buy bronze, silver and even gold-plated ones. These will leave the fingernails free, but protect the ball of the finger when rocking the needle. This colonial stick-on thimble also works well, as it has good grip. It can be purchased either singly or paired with a smooth version for use on the underneath finger. Protecting the underneath finger is more problematic. The rocking motion of quilting between two thimbles works best if this surface is relatively smooth, and some people don't use anything on their underneath finger as their skin hardens to form a callus, making it more or less pain-free. Unfortunately, I've never made calluses, I just bleed, so in my time I have tried out most gadgets marketed for the underneath finger. One of my teachers used to wrap a piece of sellotape around her finger and then knew when the needle was in the right place as she could hear it hit the sellotape. It made her needle sticky, but it worked for her. Another friend uses her false nails. This plastic nail will do the same job. It can be worn as a nail or turned round to protect the ball of your underneath finger. All of these work with a varying degree of success. Again, it's very much personal preference. My two pretty silver thimbles are ideal for my underneath finger, but as I wear holes in my underneath thimbles, I wouldn't dream of using them. Actually, the cheap thimbles found in markets seem to work best for me, although finding one that actually fits can be mission impossible. I have been known to tape one onto my finger with zinc oxide tape to prevent it falling off, especially in the winter when my hands are cold. It may take time to get used to an underneath thimble, and wearing one when not sewing can help you become accustomed to one. For students who really hate having a thimble on their underneath hand, I have found that these thimblets to be far and away the most popular alternative. They actually fit the finger better if they're cut in half, which means a packet of them will last a long time. Right, now all I need is a needle. Quilting needles are called betweens and they are short and stubby and this is because the quilting stitch is traditionally formed by rocking the needle between two thimbles and a longer thinner needle would be more likely to bend and break when stitching this way. When I first started quilting it was a challenge to thread these small needles but fortunately there are now several brands that come with a big eye and that makes it much easier to thread the needle and allow you to use some of the thicker threads. Needle size is again by number. With threads, the finer the thread, the bigger the number. With needles, it's the same principle. As the number increases, the size of the needle decreases, with the smallest needle being a size 12. There is a theory that a smaller needle will give you smaller stitches, but I don't recommend starting with anything smaller than a size 10. I personally prefer using a size 10 needle as I can load more stitches onto that than the smaller size 12. When using a thicker thread, I may go for a slightly larger size 9 needle. You can buy betweens needles as packs all of one size or in a pack containing several sizes. 
This may be your best option, as you can then try several sizes to find which you are most comfortable using. Of course, when you start, you might not like any of them, but you will eventually find the size that suits you best. Which brand and size of needle you use is down to availability and personal preference. My personal favourite is a Big Eye Bohin size 10 needle. Even with a big eye, these small needles can be a challenge to thread, especially if using a thicker thread. If I have a pale colour thread, having a dark background will provide contrast and help me see both the needle and the thread. Cutting the thread at a 45 degree angle with a nice pair of sharp scissors will give me a point rather than a blunted end to my thread, and that will also help. I find holding the needle still and bringing the thread to the needle works best for me. But if you find that difficult, try holding the thread in your thumb and first finger and bring the needle down onto it. If your thread is dark, then a light background should help you thread the needle. Some people will thread, or get a friend to thread, a whole packet of needles in one go, rather than thread a needle each time the thread runs out. The length of thread should be about 18 to 20 inches, which is about fingertip to elbow of the same arm. Longer lengths may tangle and make annoying knots or even become frayed and break. There is a school of thought that says you should use the thread in the orientation it comes off the spool, so that the first bit off the spool is the end that goes through the eye of the needle. However, if you're using a variegated thread, you may need to use the thread upside down to get a better continuation of the different colours in it, and I can honestly say I've never noticed the difference when hand stitching. So, with my needle threaded and my work in the hoop, finally I'm all set up and ready to show you how to quilt. The next thing I'm going to do is make a knot in the end of my thread so that I can anchor the thread before I start stitching. And to do that, I'm going to bring the tail end of the thread around in a loop. And so then the tail end of the thread will lie along the needle and point towards the eye. That way I can then pick up both the eye of the needle and the tail end of the thread in my thumb and first finger of my sewing hand. And use the other hand to wrap the thread one, two, three, four times round the needle. Now I'm going to hold those threads and the needle, give the needle a little push and then pull it through. And what I should have at the end of it is a freestanding French knot. Now that knot is going to go inside my quilt sandwich. So it's going to get anchored in the wadding. And I am going to now decide where I'm going to start stitching so that I know where to anchor the thread. And the sweetest part for quilting is in the centre. But actually there are a lot of lines converging in the centre and that might make it quite difficult to make it look neat if every end started and finished in the middle. And so the best bet is to go to the base of one of the small hearts and then you have got a nice gentle curve all the way around to the base of the opposite small heart before you actually have to worry about where you are going. That will give you time to concentrate on trying to master the quilting stitch. So I'm going to start here and I'm going to bury the knot in the wadding but what I won't do is put the needle in in the direction I'm going to stitch because that would leave the knot and the tail over here. If I bring the needle in in the opposite direction, that will help when the tail is laying in this direction, 
that when I come and stitch back over it, it should help to anchor that thread. So to make sure that I'm only going through into the wadding, I have now put my finger underneath. That way I will know if I have hit my finger underneath and as I don't do pain, I will make jolly sure that that needle only goes in under the line that I'm going to stitch and in only as far as the wadding. And then when I pop the knot, it gets stuck in the wadding and then I can start stitching. That tail is too long. Because that is quite long, I could actually pull it back, get my scissors and cut it. However, there is a quicker way and that is simply to put the needle back in but only just under the fabric, not into the wadding. And then if you gently rotate the needle, then that tail should disappear. And then I can pull my thread just to make sure that it is still well anchored. So having now anchored my thread, I'm ready to stitch. So I need to put on my underneath thimble. And I'm going to use my first finger today. Now, when I start quilting, I'm going to balance the work in the hoop on my little finger and my thumb, which leaves any of those fingers free to wear the underneath thimble. I'm going to have to bring the work a little bit closer to myself so that I can see what I'm doing. And I'm also going to need to rotate the work around because I want to be able to stitch in that direction. Here is my underneath thimble. Can you see it wiggling backwards and forwards? I can also actually see that tail, so I'm going to try and make him lie a bit straighter under the stitching. There we go. I am going to have that thimble there ready to put the needle onto it. Because what I'm going to do is balance the needle between these two thimbles. I'm not going to hold the needle. So I need this underneath thimble here ready for the needle to go on top of it. What I don't want to do is put the point in and then dig around trying to locate it because that doesn't do the point of the needle any good and it will also give you a bigger gap. So there is my underneath thimble and I have put the needle now onto it and I'm going to transfer the grip so that now the needle is balanced between those two thimbles and I'm not holding it. The underneath thimble is pushing up and the top thimble is pushing down. If I can get my thumb forward, that's going to help me with the rocking motion, but it will also compress the layers and make it easier to bring the needle back up to the surface. So as I gently lower the eye of the needle towards the fabric, I'm going to push that underneath thimble hard up against the point and then when I push with the top thimble, the stitch will come up. And how hard I push will determine how big my stitch is. How soon I push underneath will determine the size of my gaps. And this is all about timing. So there is my balanced needle and now thumb forward, rock the needle back, push the underneath thimble towards it and a gentle push to bring the needle back up to the surface. I can now move the underneath thimble away, hook the needle back up onto the top thimble, lever it back, push the underneath thimble and tap the needle. And I can see the stitches, well I can see that stitch, I can't see the first one, and I can see the gaps. 
and what I'm aiming for are stitches that are the same size as each other and gaps that are the same size of each other but not necessarily the same size as the stitches. And I could go for one more and they look pretty even so I'm going to pull them through. If I didn't like them, I would pull the needle back rather than do the stitch and then say, oh, I'm going to unpick it. So it's much easier to just pull the needle back. Now at home, I quite often just sew that first stitch, but my underneath thimble is there and I still push it against the needle before I push with my top thimble. And then I will open my hand up and do the other stitches. Now those don't look the same size, so I will do them again. I find that sewing actually helps me gauge that first stitch rather than balancing the needle and it's also quicker. Now I'm getting about three stitches on my needle at a time because I've been doing this for a very long time but you'll probably find that you can only get one or possibly two when you first start. Actually one stitch is perfectly okay. It just makes it slightly harder to gauge whether your stitches are even. But to start off with, you'll probably only be too glad to get stitches at all, so I wouldn't worry about that too much. If, when you come to finish this piece, you really don't like these first stitches, that's the time to go and fix them, i.e. remove them and replace them with some better stitches. But don't just constantly do a few and unpick, do a few and unpick, because you'll just spoil the fabric and get frustrated. This takes time. I'm afraid I make it look easy, but actually, it isn't. Now, you can see what I'm doing with my top hand. What you can't see is what I'm doing with this hand. So I'm going to bring in a piece of sheer fabric so that you can see what's happening with the underneath finger. So here is a piece of sheer fabric and this is very, very slippery so I am not going to get perfect stitches. It's also in a small hoop which means that for this one I'm going to have to actually hold on to the hoop. I can't balance it. It's too slippery, too small, and I can't stitch like that. So when I hook my hand over the hoop, the only bit I can reach in the middle for the sweet spot is actually my middle finger, where I've been using my first finger before. So for this bit, I'm going to change and put my thimble on my middle finger because that has a much better reach. Now when you start and you find it difficult to have the thimble on the underneath finger, you'll find that if you put the thimble on that finger, you'll use that one. And then when you put the thimble on that finger, you'll use that one. So if you're not used to thimbles and you can't make up your mind which finger to use, put a thimble on both until you've made up your mind. Right, so here is my underneath thimble at an angle, pushed up, ready to meet the needle. And I'm now transferring the grip and not holding the needle. Look how the fabric is compressed when I put my thumb forward. I'm going to lever the needle, push the underneath thimble, and then push the top thimble to bring the needle forward. And again, how hard I push will govern the size of my stitch. So there's the balancing, thumb forward, lever and push, lever and push, lever and push. And one more for look, 
lever and push. They're not particularly even, but only I can see that because it's shiny. If I do my sewing per stitch, it is exactly the same. I do the same with the underneath thimble, then open up my hand and I lever and push, lever and push, lever and push. And if I do it again without talking, they might even look even. So this is a bit like patting your head and rubbing your tummy. And I think the thing that people find the hardest is actually getting that thumb forward to do the rocking motion. Oh. I'm going to have to bring it a bit closer to me again to see. And it's that bit nobody has a problem with. But if you keep doing it that way and clutching hold of the needle, what you're doing is actually putting strain on your base of your thumb and in your wrist. And that can translate to a pain right up your arm. But if you can bring your thumb forward, not only is it helping you with the rocking motion, it's actually taking the strain out of your hand and means you can quilt for much longer. Now I'm coming down to the centre and I'm just going to continue my line of stitching across the centre and come back up. the next part of the big central petals. And I'm going to do a gentle curve rather than try and change direction and go back the way I came. And I'm going to work my way up to that point and then decide where I'm going next, which will be determined by how much thread I have left. So I'm just going to quickly go away and do that and then we'll join again when I get to here to show you what to do next. Okay, so I have now come up to the base of the small heart opposite where I started. And I think at this point, I would like you to run your fingers along your stitching because you shouldn't really be able to feel them. They should just be nice and smooth, just like regular stitching. And the reason I'm saying that, I'm going to bring in another piece. Because those of you who crunch your work up in your hands to, instead of using a hoop to work, will probably pull your work far too tight. And instead of sewing and keeping a regular tension, you will pull it tighter and you will be able to feel the stitches like a fishbone instead of just a nice smooth surface. So if you don't use a hoop, don't smock, just sew. And just one more point, if I am using my thumb, to compress the layers. If you crunch it up in your hands, the reason you do that is to use this thumb. What I'm doing when I quilt is I'm also using a thumb, but I'm using the thumb on the same hand as my top hand. So we're both using the thumb, it's just a different one. So it's worth persevering with trying to use a hoop and use the thumb on your top hand rather than on your other hand. Right, so back to here at the base. Now I could change direction and come back around to where I started. And if I roughly lay my thread, I have enough to do that. But I could also start going around this small heart. And if I come round and carry on my curve upwards and go around the heart that way, 
it will then leave me free to come back round and go around the other heart. So if I bring the pattern in, I have started there, gone around and I am now here. I'm going to go and I'm going to stitch around to this point and then I can either continue my heart and go back in and finish that half petal later or I could go around to here, slide the needle into the wadding, do that half petal and then slide the needle back and come back and stitch or I may run out of thread and if I run out of thread it would be okay to run out here or here but not halfway round a curve. So I'm going to actually have to stitch this to decide where I'm going. And now I am working towards the edge of the work in the hoop. I'm going to have to hook my thumb over to stabilize the hoop. And the first few stitches are going to be fine, but the next little bit that curve is going to be quite tight compared to the gentle curves I've been stitching so far. Can you hear that underneath thimble scraping away underneath? This is why I don't use those pretty silver thimbles underneath because they get holes in and I wreck them very, very quickly. You can get silver thimbles mounded at a jeweler's, but it's quite an expensive process. Oh, I've got a little knot, which I've now smoothed out. Sometimes the end of your thread here gets a little rough and you can either wet your fingers and smooth it and hope it stays together. But if it catches again, I will cut that tiny bit off. So although I've been getting two or three stitches on at a time, now I'm coming around to the tighter curve, I will probably only get one on. I can still get two there, and the next time will only be one. Now what I'm not going to do is go from here up to that petal because it would strand this part of the heart and it would be very difficult to make the line of stitching look continuous if I did that. So no matter what happens, I am going to go down to at least the center of this heart first. Now I have to decide, have I got enough thread to slide it back up and do that petal? And the answer is probably, but I won't have a lot of thread left. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish here and join in there, do that petal, slide the needle in and come back around that heart. So to finish, I'm going to bring the thread around in a circle again, just like I did to start with. And this time I'm going to hold the thread and wrap the needle twice around the thread. And now I'm going to pull the needle through and I've kept hold of the thread, which is a loop that is getting smaller and smaller. And when it is small, I will put the needle through that loop 
And then when I pull on the end of the thread nearest me, it will tighten the knot. And at the same time, I push the knot down on the needle. And what I have done is I've pushed it far enough that I've got enough thread between where it came out of the fabric to the knot to make one last stitch. And because I'm coming up to a point, I'm going to go back in the direction I've just stitched and pop the knot. If I had done that somewhere along, say, where these lines intersect, I could have gone underneath where I'm going to stitch because stitching over it would help to anchor the knot. Now I'm going to get my scissors and pull the thread taut and holding the scissors horizontally, snip the thread above the fabric, not too close to it, and then scratch the hole closed. So I'm now going to join in another thread and start there. And when I have stitched around to here, we will come back and show you what I do then. When I finished my last thread, I didn't have enough room to make another stitch before I reached the point where the line changes direction. So I finished my with my last stitch and there's actually a gap there before the heart changes direction. And it looks like exactly the same is going to happen here, that I have enough room for one more stitch, but not to bring it back up again to make another one. So I'm just going to put that last stitch only into the wadding and then bring the point of the needle up where that heart changes direction. So I've had my finger underneath again, so I know I haven't gone all the way through, so there's not a big stitch on the back. And now I can turn my work around. And again, because I'm quite close, I've had to hook my thumb over the edge of the hoop. And now I can carry on stitching. And that now looks as if that line is continuous. And if I'm lucky, I might even get a stitch. Look at that. So that looks like the gap goes into that part of the heart. And I can now work my way around and carry on quilting. And I've got enough thread to go Ooh. certainly to there and possibly all the way around to there. If I don't think when I get to that point that I've got enough to do that half of the heart, then it would be better to finish there, join a new thread in to do the heart. And then I could if I bring it round so that you can see better. If I did that and finish there, then I could do the heart, half a heart, slide the needle, do the petal, slide it back and then carry on. And then I would finish there because I would have already have done these lines. And then I can carry on and do all four of these central small heart units. And to do that, I'm going to go and take myself off to the comfy chair because it's much comfier to do this in an armchair with your back well supported and good light than it ever is doing it at a table. So you actually have the advantage of not being in a proper workshop where you'd be in a church hall somewhere with a very uncomfortable seat. You can do this at leisure and hopefully be comfortable doing it at the same time. So now I've done all of this center and looking at it, the finishing line here is definitely not good. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and yeah, pull that finishing stitch out. Now I've got a nice big needle with a, a huge eye on it. 
because it would be very, very difficult to thread my small quilting needle with such a small piece of thread. So I'm going to put my finger underneath to make sure my needle doesn't go all the way through to the back. And I'm going to put the needle in where the stitch should have finished. And because there's nowhere else to stitch around here that would help to anchor that thread, I will go back on itself because that will be more secure. I'm going to wet my finger and try and thread the needle and pull that thread through. If it didn't go through easily, I would have poked it through with my quilting needle. And now I've got a big eye so the knot fits in there as well, so that when I pull, everything goes in and then I can scratch the holes closed. And now that looks a lot tidier. So this is the get out of jail tool for any time the thread breaks and leaves you with a small end or like me, you want to fix something that went wrong and you haven't got much thread left to do it. Now, having done all of this, I am now going to go on and do the heart and the curved lines. So I'm going to need to move my hoop. I'm going to turn it around and loosen the screw. And there's no point in doing the heart if I haven't got the whole of the line in. So what I'm going to do is move, move the needle because I don't want to bend it. I'll make sure that the bit that I want to quilt is in the hoop. So this continuous line in the heart is in all the way up to this point because it won't all go in the hoop in one go. Pat the hoop down to make sure that it's uh, not too tight and then put the hoop back on. And that feels okay, so I'll tighten the screw. Now I could start here and go around the heart and then either go up here or around here. But in actual fact, it's easier if I start at this point and then I can come down and around the heart and then back out, probably to about there. Because all these lines converge here, it's actually easier to start and finish at a point where the line just changes direction rather than where all these lines will be joining. And because I'm going to do this curve first, the fleur-de-lis in the corner will come out behind those lines. If you choose to do it the other way, the fleur-de-lis will come forward from the heart and these lines will line behind. And it's entirely up to you which way you do it, but please, whichever way you choose, stick to it and do all four corners the same. I started a second thread here and worked my way around, but now the work is outside my hoop. Now there's absolutely no law that says you have to finish one thread off before you can start another. So I've just left this end and I can pick that up and continue quilting with it when I've moved the hoop. I've joined in another thread and gone around here and I've got just about enough thread to get me to that point. But it's going to be quite difficult when I get there to finish off because it's very close to the edge of my hoop. So I'm going to just put the needle in there and now I'm going to move the hoop. I'm going to undo it before I do. And what I'm going to try and do is position the hoop so that I can now get in all of that particular quarter. And I think it will just about do it. If it doesn't fit, then if I tack a towel onto the edge of my quilt, if I get the right edge first, 
If I tack this across there, then when I put my hoop in, obviously it would stretch over there and because it's a towel, it wouldn't slip in the hoop. I don't think I need to do that this time. So I'm going to put the underneath under. And pat it down a little bit. And it's not quite in there, so I'm going to move it up a little bit more and put it down. This is a bit loose, but I'm working over here, so it shouldn't bother me. I'm going to tighten the hoop. And then what I can do is I can finish this thread here, because I probably am really stretching it to try and get over there. And then I'm going to join in and go around. If it doesn't quite work because it's very close, then I'll join another piece here and go around and then just finish off those couple of stitches without a hoop. And then this center piece, I will treat separately and start here and work around and finish there. When I've done that, then I can move to the next quadrant and finish that one off and work around until I've done all four. So now I'm coming around and I'm almost finished. And because this is the last little bit, it's very, very faint. And I'm not sure that I can see the marks along that curve clearly enough to make it match that side. So what I've done is I've printed another pattern piece and I've cut out just this segment. And then I can line it up with what I've already stitched. Into there. And now, here's my blue fine line water soluble pen. Oh, I moved it. And now, with that in position, I can use that as a template to trace around the outside. And I can just see that line so I can bring the two together. And now I have an accurate line that I can finish my quilting. So by the time you get to this stage, you should be in some sort of rhythm with your stitching, but your stitches might not yet be even. And if they're not, if your stitches are smaller than the gaps between, it is much easier to make the stitch bigger by pushing a little bit harder than it is to ever try and figure out what's going on underneath. Oh, I don't like that stitch. It's too small. And it's quite often it's that very first stitch that's the problem one.
And now I can wet that to remove the marks with some nice cold water on a clean J cloth. My stitches have all gone through to the back. There are very, very few missed, and that's because that I have been quilting for quite a long time now. And my stitches aren't as even on the back as they are on the front. And that's because I'm concentrating on getting my front stitches looking nice. Providing you get 60 to 70% of your stitches through, then the whole thing will hold together. And that is the whole point of quilting, is to stitch two bits of fabric with a warm layer between them and keep the three together, especially when they're washed. So don't worry about the back, worry about the front until you've got some more confidence and practice in your quilting. And if you can get the front looking nice, then you've done a very fine job. I'm going to just wet that ink off and let it dry. While my work is drying, I can prepare the cushion back. And I have taken the remaining piece of my half metre of fabric and I have folded in twice to make a quarter of an inch hem on both edges. And now if I fold it in half and crease that line, I can then use that line with my ruler and my rotary cutter to divide that piece in half. So now I've got my two cushion back pieces. So I can bring my work in. I have removed all of the basting threads apart from the outside ones. And I could have removed those, but I didn't. So now I have got my right side facing and I want to put the right side of the cushion back and I'm going to use a 3 8 of an inch seam allowance. So I think before I do that, what I'm going to do is I can just see my brown outline. I'm going to find my blue pen and I'm going to make a 3 8 of an inch line outside my outer pattern line, just faintly. And it's quite faint, but I will be able to see it to line up the fabric. But I probably need to buy a new blue pen. Now having done that, I can now use the blue line to put my cushion backs up against. So I can line up the one nearest to me with the right side facing the right side of the cushion and then I can pin that together. I'll only put a couple of pins in for now. And then I could either take this away and machine stitch round it or I can just add in the next cushion back, again with the right side facing the right side of the cushion and pointing inwards to the centre of the cushion and I can line those up as well. And if I'm careful I can make sure they overlap and then what I'm going to do is machine stitch around the whole thing. 
and I'm going to use a 3 8 of an inch seam allowance because that's what I marked with my blue pen. So my stitching should come out on the outer line that you marked on your pattern. And I can stitch this all in one go. So I could decide to just machine stitch here and then add this one. And then machine stitch there. Or I can actually just pin everything on and then machine stitch around the whole thing. And when that's all pinned in place, I will take it and machine around and then I will trim all the outside edges. I will then turn everything so that it's right side out, which I can't do until I've pinned it. Just to show. So when that's all machine stitched, you will turn it inside out and you will have an envelope back. But obviously I can't really do that until it has been machine stitched. I will check it first to make sure that everything is okay in case something needs fixing. And if it is, then I will go back in with my machine and I will overlock all the raw edges to prevent them fraying. So here we have the finished cushion which has now been trimmed and I have gone around it. It's still a bit damp at the corners where I marked I still had a little bit of blue pen. If your fabric was dark you might have found it more useful to mark it on your inner side which will probably be either muslin or lawn or something pale. So you could have marked it up on that side instead. Now it's time for the great reveal. I have no idea what this is going to look like. But I pull it all inside out. And poke out the corners. As I say, they're a little bit damp, so they'll probably look better when it's completely dry. Here is the finished cushion and this should fit a 16 inch or a 40 centimeter cushion pad because you always make your cushion about an inch smaller than the cushion pad so it will plump out and uh, look nice and full. So there you have it. And here is my finished cushion. I may have made it look easy, but I'm afraid it isn't. Mastering any new technique takes time and practice and hand quilting definitely takes both. Some people take to it straight away, but I wasn't so fortunate and it took me quite a long time to crack it. As someone new to hand quilting, here are the key points to remember. Try and get the stitches even on the front of your work rather than worry about the back. It will be inside a cushion. There's the back of the cushion. Nobody will see the stitches. As long as 60 to 70% of the stitches go all the way through the layers, they will hold together when washed. And that is the point of quilting. Also, try not to unpick your first stitches so that by the end, you can see your quilting progression. It is at this end point you can fix your first stitches if you are desperate to do so. 
don't expect to have absolutely perfect stitches by the time you have finished a cushion. One well-known whole cloth quilter is fond of telling her students that you have to have made a double bed size quilt before you've really mastered hand quilting. That's 36 cushions folks, so one down, 35 to go. Hopefully it won't take you as long as that, but from now on in it's practice, practice, practice. It's actually better to do a little hand stitching every day to keep your hands and eyes coordinated. If you only quilt occasionally, then a practice piece can be useful. 10 minutes of stitching on something that doesn't matter will help you regain coordination before stitching on a precious quilt. This cushion could be your practice piece. If you're really unhappy with the final product, give it to a friend who can't sew. He or she will think it absolutely wonderful. <laughs> so good luck, happy quilting, and I hope you have a lot of fun.